Well, everyone, we finally have it. We have the Battle of Alberta, and I am joined today by Brett Holden, host of Locked On Oilers. Um, How are you doing? How's everything shaping up over there? I'm doing fantastic. It is a beautiful day in Edmonton, and it's just leading into the Battle of Alberta, and I cannot, I cannot wait. I genuinely can't wait. I'm excited, and I mean, you, you're you local, so it's going to be even more exciting for you. Uh, are you planning on going to any of the games? I'm planning on going to uh, the Game 2 watch party for sure. Okay. A couple of uh, friends and I are going out there, but uh, with uh, especially with a quick turnaround for Locked On, I'm going to be I'm going to be on here and just making sure that uh, we got content for the next day. I'm, I'm excited. Honestly, uh, <laughs> that's what it's all about here. Yeah. Um, so... A few things that I I noticed from round one was, of course, Leon Dreisaitl. What what is going on there? There was just a tweet put out saying that he he's playing tomorrow. So what what does that mean? What does that mean for the Oilers? That's a great question. Honestly, even when a lot of people, or even when uh, Leon Dreisaitl was saying that he was going to play in Game 7, a lot of people were like, oh, how healthy is he going to be? And it, a, the first thing that people noticed was they didn't really have that stride in Game 7 that Con- or, uh, Leon Dreisaitl has. He has a low, powerful stride that really comes from that lower body. And he just didn't have that. So he said today, and uh, Jay Woodcroft said, actually, excuse me, yesterday, that uh, every Everybody who didn't skate in practice, which included Leon Dreisaitl, will be available for the game. I really think that Leon Dreisaitl, as long as he took these few days off between Game 7 and Game 1 of this series and really took advantage of taking care of his body, he's a gamer, man. And I really think that he is going to... He's going to be Leon Dreisaitl. Let's be real. Leon Dreisaitl is Leon Dreisaitl, and him playing for the Oilers at any point is a very, very, very big issue for anybody that they play. Yeah. I'm, I hope he's healthy (laughs) for for himself, but I hope he's not healthy enough to play (laughs) for my own selfish reasons. But (laughs) I mean, how, how does this series compare to the LA Kings who weren't really supposed to be a playoff team? Well, and that's the thing. I think that's a lot of what uh, Oilers fans and a lot of people around the Oilers are kind of sitting there going, like, we were supposed to beat the Kings. And and our previous, when I teamed up with Sarah at Locked on Kings, we we said that the Oilers were going to win. Both of us said that the Oilers were going to win in six. (laughs) That didn't happen. It almost looked like the Kings could have won it in game six. And Honestly, they probably should have. Um, but Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl came out to play. The thing about this series as opposed to the last series is that everybody expects the Flames to win this series as opposed to the Oilers. So the Oilers are going into this series as kind of the underdogs despite having Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl. And I really think that's going to fire up. I mean... Do you really want a fire underneath Connor McDavid's no. butt for this? Yeah. Um, so uh, as that... near as it is, we oh. need a bigger one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Plus, we got the Battle of Alberta. Plus, the Oilers are considered the underdogs in a wink and a nod. But I really think that this will be a physical series for the Oilers, which is not necessarily different from the Kings series because they were quite physical. It was a physical series, but it's going to be a different type of physical. The Kings are a young team that just are out there to be annoying. The Flames are there because they hate the Oilers. (laughs) So it'll be interesting to see. Definitely. Um, Are you concerned about anything really going into this this battle of Alberta what am I not concerned about honestly I, I mean we already mentioned the Leon Dreisaitl injury as as you never really know in play everybody's dinged up everybody's playing with something but when something that public is going on it's always kind of going on in your head so that's kind of something that's going on that I'm worried about I guess and a lot of Oilers fans are also worried about the other thing too obviously the goaltending everybody will talk about Mike Smith and everything like that the guy had two shutouts in the last series the guy's kind of locked in so that That'll be something that uh, a lot of people will have to watch. 
What I'm mostly concerned about, genuinely, is Darnell Nurse. I think Darnell Nurse is I he is the Oilers' number one defenseman. Let's not get that confused. But Cody Cece and Brett Kulak, and even you can toss Tyson Berry in there. Those three defensemen have all been better than Darnell Nurse by margins. I'm concerned about how Darnell Nurse will perform in the next series, especially with everybody trying to get at him in the Battle of Alberta. Yeah, I was just going to say, he had a little little incident in round one that caused uh, suspension. Do you see his uh temper getting the best of him in potentially in this round that's a really good question honestly hopefully you can learn your lesson from something like that i I do think that it was a suspendable offense and something that you know what like you said he lost his temper that's something you can't do especially in the playoffs then especially against the uh, calgary flames in the battle of alberta tempers are gonna get flared they, things are going to happen, and you can't take yourself out of the series. You just can't. You can't. It is imperative for a team success to have their number one defenseman in the lineup. And if you're not, it's not going to be a pretty pretty sight for the Oilers. Absolutely. And I think a lot of people, even um, you know, just regular hockey fans, are expecting this to be a series similar to those few games back in 2020 or 2019 that bled over into 2020. And uh, do you see this like going into like a line brawl and maybe uh, a holy fight? <laughs> ooh, ooh. See, Mike Smith was asked uh, in his press conference, I believe on Monday, if there was going to be a goalie fight. And he just gave kind of a, a smile and said, no, 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 no. But honestly, it's, it, I can see a, a full. At least two guys going at the same time. It kind of goes back to that point where where in the playoffs, you just can't have guys out. So unless it's happening late in the game and we're seeing guys dropping gloves, going at it and that type of stuff, maybe. I think most of the issues will come in front of the net. Guys stopping in front of Mark Sherman Smith, guys getting pulled away, and then that's where the issues start to come. I think it is going to get dirty. I don't know if it's going to get it just... 1980s Dave Hunter to like just going at each other or Tim Hunter, excuse me. I, I don't, I, they, the Oilers and the Flames don't have that necessarily anymore. They, I mean, the Flames have Lucic and Zadorov and Brett Ritchie's still there, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, as well. so, he is. Like, there's, there's a ton of big guys and mean guys on the Flames, but there's just, other than Zach Cassian, there isn't really much for the Oilers to match that with, unless you're willing to take Darnell Nurse off the ice for five minutes, which the Oilers aren't really necessarily willing to do so. (laughs) Yeah, that's for sure. And I think hopefully the Flames have learned uh, after their game one uh, incident where uh, Rasmus Anderson gets, you know, gets ejected from the game and he's just, it's, like you said, there's a learning curve. I think but, round one is that absolutely. perfect example. But the thing, the interesting thing between the the Flames and the Stars series was that that is a series that, I mean, there's there's some history between the Flames and the Stars, but there's not necessarily the Battle of Alberta type history. You right. know, in every single, at the start of almost every game between the Stars and the Flames, there was something going on. I, I, I was having a nap one day and I woke up and I thought that the Flames-Stars game was going on. And all I see is just fights. John Klingberg's throwing gloves with somebody else. Kachuk is getting fed. Like it was insane. And I honestly, if the Oilers get into that type of game with the Flames, they're not going to be able to keep up at all. Yeah. At all. At all. But uh, those, I, I have to be honest with you. Those are a lot of questions that really make my mind really kind of mm, go. And I'm really concerned about where the Oilers are going to go, but I'm more interested as well to see where the flames are going to go. And I do have some questions for you in just a second, but first I want to tell you about rock auto. This episode is brought to you by rock auto with the ever increasing numbers of makes and models. It is now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Why endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning? Like is your odyssey an LX or an EX and wait while the person behind the counter 
on their computer, orders the parts only on in their warehouse, excuse me, and the only parts that their warehouse happens to carry. You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket. Why choose to spend 30%, 50%, or even 100% more for the same parts from a chain store or a car dealership? In that exact same Odyssey LX or Odyssey fuel pump, at the, the, the normal chain stores, they normally go for $353. On Rock Auto, they go for $216. Save time and money while using Rock Auto. Plus, Rock Auto has been serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years and their family business. Head over to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts they have available for your car or truck. And write Locked On in their How Did You Hear About Us section uh, and let them know that we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. rockauto.com That is where we are going to start the next uh, uh, section here because I do have a lot of questions about the Flames. Obviously, there's a lot of questions surrounding the Oilers. But there, there's some creeping in for the Flames, it seems like. With the Flames and the Stars series, a lot of this, it was almost always a one or two goal decision or one or two goal game. Each game finished one nothing, 2 nothing, 4-2, 4-1, 3-1-4-2, and obviously that overtime winner by Johnny Goudreau in Game 7 to make it a 3-2 victory for the Flames. Jess, I'm curious if the Flames get in a little bit of a track meet with the Oilers and a little bit of a, a shootout with the Oilers. Are the Flames concerned? They do have, like, Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl are on the other side. Is there something to be concerned about? Yes. There's yeah. always things to be concerned about. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that um, mainly the Flames need to worry about staying off the power play or the penalty mm -hmm. kill rather, because that is where I feel like most of the goals from McDavid came from against the Flames was the power play goals. And the last thing I want to see is uh, obviously the Flames playing undisciplined hockey and allowing that to happen. Totally. And I mean, that also goes along with how we were talking about just the grittiness between the two teams. Uh, something interesting that came up while I was looking at uh, the series between the Flames and the Stars was Dylan Dubé leads the Flames in hits. He has 21 hits so far in the seven games of the playoffs. That is the exact same as the Oilers' fourth best hitter, Connor McDonald. David uh is there kind of a concern where are the big guys like are the big guys not throwing hits we know Zadorov was was it had a hearing recently but are they just not throwing hits or is that kind of a, a meaningless stat do you think um I think it's uh it's hard to say I think that the like the big guys that are on the fourth line have been really more focused on playing um of just playing hockey and not yeah. needing to throw those hits, but they're not afraid to when it comes to it. I think that Dylan Dubé has kind of come into his own this season and especially towards the playoffs, but I would really like to see, you know, players like Brett Ritchie and Milan Lucic who are on the ice for that reason yeah. to start getting into it. Well, and honestly, as an Oilers fan, the, there were rumors that the Oilers were trying to get in the offseason Nikita Zadorov in a trade kind of similar to that uh, Ethan Bear trade that we saw that brought Warren Fogel over to the Oilers. But as an Oilers host, as an Oilers fan, I think a lot of people are seeing Nikita Zadorov. They're like, man, that's a, that's a scary human being. <laughs> how, how important is Nikita Zadorov for the Flames? You know... I was very hard on him this season. Really? Um, yeah, there were definitely some moments where he was not um, not performing well. To be honest, he was really struggling uh, defensively. But he's kind of he's turned it around. I think that he has had this ability to just again find his game in uh, Daryl Sutter's system, and he's been he's been really good. And I think that it is important. Um, you know, he did have that awkward collision in game seven into the net, but 
I and you know, Flames fans they were worried. They were yeah. worried. And, well, and he didn't end up missing a shift, so he was fine, but that that brings me to another point. I, I think are the Flames blue line at all beaten up? I mean, we saw Oliver Shillington moving his shoulder around a bunch. Oliver Shillington, I am a big fan of Oliver Shillington. That guy has been in way too many accidents this season, and some of the ugliest accidents I've seen ever on the sheet of ice. He's he's been moving that shoulder around. Uh, Chris Tanev was injured as well in the last series. Is is the Flames blue line kind of beaten up? Yeah, I yeah. I would say yes. Um, you know, Oliver Shillington, like you said, has taken so many weird accidental <laughs> slides and hits, like hits to the board. He had a really scary collision. Um, I couldn't tell you when it was because time yeah. is real. But I thought that he was going to be out for a really long time because of how severe his head went into the boards. But you know, he missed a few games, but, and then in game seven, he did uh, have that shoulder injury sort of thing going on, but um, he went back down the tunnel and came right back to the bench. So um, I would say that he's one of those guys who, because this is his first year on the roster full time, that will leave it all out on the ice. He will, he'll play until that shoulder is dangling by a thread and, same thing with Chris Tanev. He was injured in game six. They were without him in game seven. He was at practice today. So that's a positive sign. But I do I do worry because he is known for his injuries. And I don't necessarily want him to uh, to risk it all. Well, that's an interesting point that you mentioned is is the history of Christopher Tanner. The thing, the difference between the Kings and the Flames for the Oilers is that the Oilers are coming off of a Kings defensive core that had Sean Dursey, Mikey Anderson, and really the two only most experienced defensemen on that team was a Cupless Alexander Edler, and the only guy with a Stanley Cup on that defense was Ollie Matta because Drew Doughty was hurt. Now you go over to the Flames and they have Noah Hannafin. We mentioned Chris Tanev. We mentioned Nikita Zadorov has been playing in the league for a little while as well. Uh, I, I'm missing a defenseman as well off the top of my head. Hanson, there we go. Um, those are all guys who have been established in the league for a while. Is that going to be something that the Oilers should be concerned about as well? I mean, I mean, we mentioned that they might be beaten up, but I mean, the experience is a totally different, well, experience for the Oilers from the Kings to the Flames. Yeah, I think it's definitely something that the Oilers are going to be, uh, it'll be a change for them, but they'll probably be thanking Noah Hannafin at some point because he is, he was responsible, I think, for at least two or three goals, and he even banked one off his own butt. So, <laughs> I mean, honestly, he's kind of my biggest cause for concern. Um, so, you know, just shoot the puck a lot when Noah Hannafin's on the ice. But <laughs> other than good. that, I, I, I really think that the Flames defense has stepped it up big time, uh, even in terms of, uh, you know, their captain, Mark Giordano leaving. I think that this defense is a lot better without him. And I feel a little guilty saying that, but it's also, <laughs> you know, it's the name of the game. Absolutely. It's a business. I have two uh, quick questions, two more questions for you before we move on here. The first one, and these are kind of the obvious ones, and that's why I kind of laid it out for later. But the first one is being, how do you actually feel about facing Mike Smith? Oh, um, <laughs> you know, I think it's going to be a lot easier <laughs> than facing Ben Ottinger. But I think, like you said earlier, he's locked in. He had two shutouts last series. But I think it's going to kind of be a breath of fresh air, but I don't think it's <laughs> going to be the, like a walk in the park by any means. Interesting. Former Flames. We'll see if that uh, also lights uh, a flame under his butt. We mentioned that uh, Connor McDavid has uh, a fire under his butt. And I'll, I'll wrap this, uh, my questions off with this one. How do you neutralize Connor and Leon? That's a really good question. Uh, <laughs> 
oh, I, I just, I think that you just have to get under their skin. I think that's just mm. all you're going to have to do. You're going to have to be in their face. You're going to have to play, like, just ridiculous hockey. You have to just figure out a way to to just stop them. I don't, I don't have the answers, and that's why I'm not a hockey coach. But I just... I don't know. Jacob Markstrom is a fantastic goalie, and I think that he will probably be the solution there. Well, I think a lot of uh, coaches around the league also say the same thing. <laughs> we, we have no idea to stop. <laughs> How to stop? Yeah. Him. No, that's uh, that was a really good question because I just I don't think there is a true uh, quick fix answer. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely no absolutely uh shall we uh i, I honestly think that there uh, that was really most of the questions that i think uh the f- at least from the oilers perspective uh are worried about from the flames or at least uh, are wondering about from the flame side so uh, do you really think that uh the flame well we'll get more into predictions but do you really how badly do you think the flames will will kind of uh take advantage of the oilers on the 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 penalty kill excuse me when the oilers are on the penalty kill how's your power play it depends oh uh no they weren't they were not good uh against uh dallas for whatever reason well i well it was the nottinger and goal (laughs) so i think that's kind of the situation behind that but yeah I think, again, the circumstances are going to be different. I think that this will be, um, you know, you're not playing a brick wall. <laughs> Even when Ben Bishop was in goal for them, it was the same problem. Guys like 6'6", but um, I just, I think it's going to be a little different. I think that the Flames are capable of playing better hockey than they did in round one against the Oilers. They were saving it up. Exactly. Exactly. Shall we uh, move on? Yes. But first, um, before we jump into predictions and all of that goodness, uh, I want to talk to you guys about Built Bar. Uh, I just received my birthday cake puffs in the mail, and I have never, ever had anything quite like this. They are available right now, and you can get them on built.com they are this marshmallowy goodness that tastes like frosting with sprinkles it is you feel like you're eating the worst thing for you (laughs) they're only 150 calories and they have 16 grams of protein which is fantastic um they're good if you want to uh build muscle lose weight maintain weight it's they're it's delicious um and it's a really healthy way to get that sweet tooth, you know, satisfied. So all built puffs, not just the birthday cake ones, are covered in 100% real chocolate. And that means that with built, you can eat healthy and actually enjoy it. Again, tastes like a candy bar without the negatives of a candy bar. And they, uh, they are actually made with collagen protein, which helps your body absorb more efficiently hmm. and provides a lot of health benefits. Um, go to built.com today to get birthday cake puffs now. Go to built.com and use promo code LOCKED15 and get 15% off of your order. That's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. So... Oh, I was so excited because in the group chat, everyone was posting theirs and yeah. I, I need to go down and get mine yeah, <laughs> right, right outside my door. And I was like, yes, this is the best mail day. Almost a perfect little present. Right. Exactly. Um, and the people over at Built, Built Bar are really great people. So if you're interested in supporting them, you have our seal of approval. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Now, are you a superstitious kind of fan? Like, do you have any weird, quote unquote, weird, like pregame rituals or anything? Uh, not pregame rituals. Uh, I'll, I'll be 100% honest with you. I will 
I have always said that I wasn't superstitious until I was sitting in uh, my room the other day and going, I, I'm certainly a superstitious Oilers fan, 100%. I mean, my mother won't even watch the playoff games because in game two when the Oilers won, she was upstairs watching a different game. My dad will watch the game. We all watch the games independently. and. I love uh, it. and- in fact, like I, I have made a point to watch a, away from my parents because it is it, that has been a superstition for our, us. Another superstition that I've had is actually this jersey over my right shoulder. It used to be uh, a Yesapuli RV jersey, but when the Oilers lost two games in a row in games uh, f- uh, four and five, I, I couldn't. I had to go back to this one. So <laughs> this one's staying right now. Are you? Are you superstitious? I. I used to be. Yeah. Um, I'm from Boston, so um, and my friends and I, we would go out um, when the Bruins were in the playoffs, and we'd go to this one local dive bar, and we would sit at this corner uh, seat at the bar. We'd have our pitcher of Bud Light and a pizza, and like it got to the point where the bartenders knew we were coming in, and it was just so much fun. And uh, now I kind of just pace around my living room. Um, yeah. And just, I mean, I've locked my friend in the bathroom before because <laughs> what? There, it was the Super Bowl and Julian Edelman. It was the um, Patriots Atlanta Super Bowl. Ah. So I, she went to the bathroom, and I told her, "You can't come out." <laughs> you, and her mom, we were at her house, and her mom was like, "You have to stay in there." What? And she still hasn't watched uh, the full comeback. She's like, "I can't do it." Really? Yeah. That is incredible. That yeah. is incredible. Yeah, so uh, truly for Flames hockey. I haven't yeah. developed anything yet. You're going to have to. Whatever you did in the first series is what you're going to have to no, do I'm in this series. I'm trying to think. Like, what did I do? But do, yeah, but do you think those superstitions or however you, you uh, go into those games, do you think they're going to help the Flames? Do you, Well, I shouldn't say help the Flames because they are the favorites right now. But do you think do – you, do, you, do you really think that the Flames are going to pull off this series? Because everybody is giving the Flames a series already, including you know, potentially me. <laughs> I think that it's one of those things where you you can't be overly confident when you go into any series because you end up getting in a lot of trouble. And I think that's Good when, oh my gosh, like in 2019 when Tampa ended up getting swept by Columbus. I mean, things like that happen. It's not like the Preds and Avs where the better team won, you know. But – um, I just think that the Flames, they need to stay level-headed and they can't get too far into their head. Right, right. I I, I, I agree. I do agree. And that's a lot of the same fact that you just, you got to stay in the game. We, we talked about if Darnell Nurse is out of, off the ice for five minutes, that's an issue for the Oilers. If a guy like matthew kachuk is off the ice for five minutes that's an issue for the flame yeah. I, I like absolutely you gotta keep your and especially in the battle of alberta it's got to be like you said level-headed absolutely let's go into we'll, we'll get our full series predictions in just a second but let's go into you want to talk about our swing players or our, our yeah, we can do that. yeah let's do that let's let's start off i i have two here i'm not sure how many you have but uh i'll let you go first who do you think is the first x factor for the the calgary flames here i, mean, I think it's gonna be elias lindholm um Ooh. you know i think that you know he had a good first round like that's not like not to take anything away from him but I think that he can um vamp it up another level and I think with his Selkie trophy nomination uh announced today he will definitely uh you know be a problem in terms of defense and offense I think that he is someone who always flies under the radar and then you're like, oh, my God, wait a second. He had, like, 43 goals in the regular season. Um, but I think he'll be – he'll definitely be a swing player this series. And, oh, gosh. Um, I don't want to say Johnny Gaudreau because he's – like, like that whole top – like, it just feels so redundant, like, just praising your top line. But Exactly. I, I have a lot of hope for uh, Rasmus Anderson – as well. I think that he 
is a fantastic defenseman. I think that he, one thing about him is that he will shoot the puck as well. I think he has learned, he learned a lot from uh, Mark Giordano and has really been able to take the next steps with Noah Hannafin as his partner. And I think it's great. I think it's a lot of, um, a lot of great stuff there. Well, the interesting thing about both of those those guys is that Elias Lindholm is an Oilers killer, it feels like. And uh, every single time the Oilers have played against the Flames, I just remember getting angry texts from my friends going, get this Rasmus Anderson guy off the ice, he's a goon! And just, yeah. just, it doesn't matter, Rasmus Anderson is into everything. And he can shoot the puck, he's great on the, he can be great on the transition. I really, uh, yeah, I, you know what, a, underrated Colin Rand Rasmus <laughs> Anderson. I hate him. I I, I hate him. I don't blame him. you. If I had yeah. played against him, I'd hate him too. <laughs> exactly, right? I, I love to hate him. I think that's the right way, yeah. <laughs> way to put it. Uh for the f- well, at least for on the Oilers side of things, I have two names that are uh a little bit more they're not Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl. Let's just put that's that fair. put that out of the way. That they're actually the first one that I'm going to mention is a defenseman who had one goal and five assists in the first season, in the first series, excuse me. And a guy that once the Oilers signed him in the off season, everybody was going, what are you doing? This guy sucked in Toronto. This guy sucked in Ottawa. Is it Cody Cece? Bingo. It's Cody Cece. It is exactly <laughs> Cody Cece. Cody Cece. I remember when the Oilers signed him, uh, the Pens fans were going, please take care of him. Please take yeah. care of him. And then all the F- Leafs fans are going, oh, of course the Oilers would sign him. He's an idiot. The guy has been uh, the the best, most consistent. And I said this about Brett Kulak the other day as well on, on one of my episodes, but Cody Cece is right there with Brett Kulak and just being the most constant defenseman for the Oilers. He forces issues in the defensive zone. And somehow this guy can get on the score sheet. It doesn't matter how, but in one game, he had three assists. Like, excuse that, me? I think once these bad, quote unquote, bad players leave Toronto, they reach this new level of player development that okay. I I'm very happy for them. But Absolutely. and especially it's so funny to me watching Cody Cece go from this guy who would fall apart in the postseason yeah. uh, against Boston, almost always, uh, you know, just crumbling, becoming this invisible <laughs> player out there, turn into what he's turned into this yeah the oilers probably premier defenseman next to darnell nurse it is crazy to think that he he was on he was paired with duncan keith because people are just like yeah whatever throw him there it's fine now he's the number one pairing for the oilers and he has been fantastic i really think he's been a, a great bright spot for the oilers and really solidifies that defense that a lot of people just didn't like for the oilers for a long time my other x factor swing player for the oilers has been somebody we already mentioned it's Mike Smith Mike Smith again two shutouts in in the last series against the LA Kings in a very high scoring series but when you take a look at the games that the Oilers won they were sound defensively and getting that starts with uh, Cody Cece but it also ends with Mike Smith and him preventing the puck from going into the net is going to be massive the interesting stat for Mike Smith that really kind of put him over the edge for me is his save percentage he is second in the playoffs between all the goalies who have played Played in save percentage. Number one was Jacob Markstrom. So might be in a little bit of a, a quiet series, more of a quiet series than we imagine here. I I can't do another quiet series. It was <laughs> kidding. It, it was brutal. I yeah. can't even lie. Because you know, you're just you know that the flames have this these strong offensive players and then to watch them just score two goals yeah in 60 minutes you're just like this is not what we wanted well and plus there was a lot of questions going can he can johnny hockey do it five on five <laughs> well <laughs> look what he did in game seven five on five <laughs> yeah he's he's he has buried these Oh, he can't perform in the postseason yeah. narratives. He 
I don't care. Even if it's just one round, I think that this was really, uh, really great for him. Totally. All right. Let's round this episode out here with our predictions. Jess, how many games does it take for the Flames to win this series? Seven. 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 Really? I think, yeah, I think it's going to be a long haul. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I think you, you have more confidence. You have more confidence than I do. Honestly, I, I'll be 100% uh, real with you. I think going into this series, uh, you know what? And it might honestly be just the 9-5 to five game. I think the 9-5 to five game has been in my head for a long time, and I just I can't shake it. And I think a lot of Oilers fans can't, and it will be very, very, very interesting to see if the Oilers have shaken that as well. Because, I mean, if the Oilers come out there and they get scored on first and – the Flames go out there and score the second. If the Oilers get down, honestly, by two goals in any of the games, I think it's going to be a, a massive issue for the Oilers, and I could see the Flames doing that. In the last series for the Oilers, every t- whichever team scored first, they won that game. So the first goal will be massive, and if the Oilers fall to the, Oil- or to the Flames early, I think it's done. I will say, I can hear my father yelling at me right now. <laughs> I'll go flames and six. I'll do it. Wow. I'll do it. Wow. I'm swallowing my pride here. I, I, I'm so sorry, oil country. I, I can, I can hear you right now. I think there's already banging on my windows calling for my head. Wait but. until this goes live. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm sorry, but uh, yeah, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much, Jess, for, for, for yes. jumping along. This is going to be fun. This has been so much fun. Thank you so much for hanging out and getting into this crazy, long-awaited Battle of Alberta. Um, Where can people find you and your show? Absolutely. You can find me personally at The Real Holden 40, but you don't have to worry about me. You can find the Locked On Podcast, uh, Locked On Oilers Podcast, anywhere you find your your podcast you can also find us on youtube as well at locked on oilers you can also send us a follow on twitter at locked on oilers everything's locked on oilers thank you so much for having me along and jess how about you uh you can follow me on twitter at jess belmosto if you want um it's usually just pictures of my cat and then you <laughs> get impulsive hockey reactions um And then you can find the show wherever you listen to your other favorite podcasts, as well as YouTube. And uh, the show's Twitter is LO underscore Flames Pod. Ooh, wonderful. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in to today's episode. And thank you so much for making us your first listen every day. We're going to have a wonderful, wonderful series, whether it goes one way or the other. Jess, I'm excited. Let's have a great one. Yes, let's do this. And... Maybe we can get a mid-series review check-in at some point because I know the people want it. Absolutely. (laughs) All right, everyone. We will see you tomorrow. Might help if I press the button.